and notices it later. Good morning and welcome. It's lovely to see you here this morning and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to uh, revise the order slightly from what's written in the, in the leaflets. There will be, instead of a retiring collection as normal, we have decided that it's possible to uh, bring the bags to you in the course of the service since there's space for uh, people to move between the seats. So it won't be passed from hand to hand and uh, there'll be a slight variation in the order of service in that regard. And I just displaced Keith from welcoming you at the start but I'm sure he'll welcome you when he gives the notices in a minute or two. We're going to begin with prayer, so let us unite our hearts and pray as we come to worship God. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. We know from periods of lockdown that it's a, a special privilege to be able to join with one another, and we're looking forward to a time when the infectious virus that's caused so much damage around the world and is still raging in places, when that is part of the past and we, we can uh, greet one another in the familiar ways. Today we ask for your presence with us and we ask that wherever Christian people raise their voices in praise of the Lord Jesus, that you will unite us with them, whatever their language, in whatever country they are, whatever the colour of their skin, whatever circumstances they meet in, whether it's on account of a virus or an oppressive regime or a war in their country, whatever it is, wherever Christian people worship you, Lord, be present with them and strengthen them for their current adversity. So, Lord, join us with the whole church, not just around the world, but in all of time. Might we have that sense of being one with all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to begin. I gave Benny the, the opportunity to choose the hymns today. And so they've come from Benny, and I have to tell you, um, I'm delighted with her choice. Of course, I would be bound to be. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think especially she's got the last hymn uh, right on exactly where I wanted the service to end. So we're going to begin, however, with hymn 63 and rejoice, To God be the glory, great things he has done. Hymn 60, well, to God be the glory. I didn't check the, I did check the number. Did you have it down? It's, it is 63. There we go. Thank you.
seated. I'd like to call Christine to bring us young at heart. Good morning. Um, some of you will remember that last year I spoke, I meant to check the date but forgot, I spoke about Harrison Craig, the singer who used singing or who found that singing helped him to overcome his stuttering. Last week I saw that SBS was advertising a program called Stutter School. I found it challenging and educational and so I did some further research. Stuttering affects one in 100 Australians, which is quite a lot when you think in, especially those of you who are working or at school, in the course of your week would probably encounter more than 100 Australians. Most of us who don't have a problem stuttering don't think twice about asking for directions or ordering a meal, or even when you're out walking, when the lockdown eases, you tend to comment to the people you pass. But what if you wanted to say something and you just could not get the words out? The documentary followed four brave Australian stutterers the youngest, a boy of 12, the oldest, a man of 66, on what was called a once-in-a-lifetime make-or-break journey to find their voice. And again, I quote from the blurb, over four confronting, intensive, and emotionally charged days, and they were emotionally charged, they are pushed to breaking point. Um, when I re-watched it once I decided to talk about it, I realized that because it was a four-day live-in program, they had to, the participants had to sign in. And I overheard a young woman saying she was there at the hotel reception. She said, I'm here for the Maguire program. So I've included in the notes, which you can find you will be able to find online, but this is called the Maguire Program, and it's an Australia-New Zealand program, which I had never heard of. So let's. the program follows four participants only, and there are more, but they selected four, um, and one can only surmise the reasons. Marcus is 12, and he comes... From a loving family, he has a younger brother and his two parents. He really enjoys sport and he's fine playing sport. But in class, ask him or expect him to look you in the eye and he just cannot. And even worse, asking him to say something or read aloud. So that's the youngest, Marcus. Then comes April, she's, she's from Byron Bay, and I think she's the only person in the program who wasn't from Melbourne. She runs her own online business. She designs, makes and sells vintage clothing. For her, it is agony having to interact with anyone, even in an op shop when she's going through old clothes to get ideas. She has a supportive sister and supportive parents. Now, Rezo has a sister, an older He's 20. She's, she's just a little bit older, and they live with their parents in Melbourne. They were born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, lived for 12 years in a refugee camp, and then were resettled in Australia. Now, Rezo attributes his stuttering to some of the horrors he saw as a young child. Of course, his sister doesn't stutter, and she saw the same um, horrors. One case, there seems to be a genetic link that the stuttering has come down the family line, but I don't think there's any simple explanation. Then we come to Paul. 
And I thought, how brave is this at 66? But he's been married for 29 years, lovely wife, and an adult son and daughter. He was unable to make a speech at his own wedding and he could not speak at the 18th birthdays nor at the 21st birthdays of his children. And that was a great sadness for him and his family, although they totally understood. I learned so much from this program. I didn't realize that even saying your own name is very hard for stutterers. So that's the first thing they have to learn to say their own name. Then they have to make a short speech. Then they have to go out into the CBD and ask, di ask for directions. I think the most common one was to ask for Burke Street Mall or Meyer, Meyer store. Finally, they have to approach total strangers and ask them and tell them what they are doing and tell them about the program. Their tutors are all recovered or recovering stutterers and they go with them onto the street. Most passers-by respond very positively. Some don't and I didn't really feel critical of them because they just didn't really know what was happening. But there are some incredibly heartwarming warming moments. Marcus, the 12-year-old, he could get off his seat to make his speech. And Rezo, the 20-year-old coloured guy from the DRC, leans over and says, I'm with you. You can do this. I believe in you. So there's this former refugee encouraging this young Melburnian. Now, Rezo was paired up with a tutor from India, and I thought maybe this compounded the problems because maybe passers-by wondered what these two people of colour were doing approaching them. I don't know. The interesting thing, I didn't know this, Graham found out yesterday, his tutor arrived from India with a stutter. First job interview they said, look, I'm sorry, you, can't, you won't get this job because of your stutter. Well, he persevered, got help, and guess what? He's done his PhD. So that is a very good Australian story. One person Rezo approached was a young adult, I thought possibly even a 16-year-old boy, young man, who was so polite and I thought, wow, if you were my son or grandson and I saw this happening, I'd feel proud. But then what happened? After a few minutes, this young man came back. And he, he must have learned from someone why Rose, Rezo had asked him for directions. And he said to Rezo, who was quite a bit taller than him, I think what you are doing is incredibly brave. And the two young men hugged. I found that quite tearful, actually. April goes back to Byron Bay, and you see her happily interacting with the public. Finally, Paul's wish is fulfilled, and this was his goal. He and his family hold a party, and he is able to make a speech and thank all those friends and relatives who have supported him through his years, his many years of stuttering. That was quite tearful too. Now what's all this got to do with us Blackburn Presbyterian? Well, of course I thought of Moses and I referred to him when I spoke about Harrison Craig. We can't really tell what Moses' speech problem was, but we knew that God gave him Abraham, Aaron to speak on his behalf to Pharaoh. Ephesians 2.10 also came to mind with its reference to the good works that God has already planned for us to do. And then a hymn I love, and it's, I think it's worth saying to yourself every day. Forth in your name, O Lord, I go, my daily labour to pursue the only the resolve to know in all I think or say or do. And of course, 
Matthew 25, verse 40. And the modern translation says, Whenever you did it for one of the least important members of my family, you did it for me. Those strangers approached on the streets of our beautiful city had no idea that they were being given and mostly grasped the opportunity to be part of an endeavour to re release their fellow citizens from the crippling bonds of stuttering. May we all every day be able to help someone whom God puts on our path. Thank you, Christine. Yes, may we do that every day indeed. Keith, the notices and the offering. On behalf of Graham and the session, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you, although our, our numbers have dropped uh, a little bit today. Um, if I may say so, uh, you're young at heart, uh, Christine, uh, brought back some uh, memories of, uh, I think before I, I entered my teen years, I did have a, um, I don't know whether you call it a stuttering problem, but uh, trying to get words out. Like you'd stand in a queue to... Um, uh, buy a train ticket and uh, you'd say yes I want so and so you'd say to yourself and then when you got up to the counter you were stuck for words you just couldn't get them out and uh, I think uh, my father told me he said the thing to do would be to uh, just stop take a, a deep breath yes. and uh, and then have another go breathing is important yep. and that's uh, tended to be, or alternatively, the, it not only just the, the breath, but I found that uh, although you might want to, you had your spiel, shall we say, already prepared, but then when you came uh, to do it, you feel, felt as though you were getting a bit st uh, um, stuck yes. uh, for words, so then I'd rephrase whatever I wanted. And I found, I found that was quite, and then I think by the time I got into the teens, uh, it, um, shall we say, departed. So, <laughs> so some people might say you wouldn't know that I, I had that problem in, in days gone by. But anyway, that's just, uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, the, we, down memory lane. Um, Next, uh, uh, next Sunday, Graham will be taking uh, a spot of uh, leave, which he deserves. And in place of uh, Graham, we have a guest speaker, uh, the Reverend Dr. Greg Goswell uh, from the um, Christ, College. Yeah, Christ College at Sydney, which is the equivalent of the uh, uh, Presbyterian College in Melbourne. So, um, uh, so he'll be there. Uh, he'll be here next week uh, preaching. And as uh, Graham has mentioned, that we've altered the sequence of the um, uh, the service in, t in also in terms of the offering. So we'll we'll now have um, uh, your free will offering for the work of the Lord uh, now. So. Uh,
We thank you, Lord, for the capacity and the opportunity to give and share in the ministry of your church. We ask that what we bring and all that we yield to you will be of service to the King of Kings. Amen. Couldn't help feeling we looked, uh, for Presbyterians, we looked decidedly unready to collect your offering. But, uh, I want to thank you for, for, uh, for your support and, uh, and, and also uh, thank you for those who uh, make your offerings electronically. We're very grateful uh, for that. We're now going to turn to the Word of God and I've asked Alistair to read the lesson to us today. So thank you, Alistair. morning to you all. Today's reading is the Gospel according to St John, chapter 1, reading from verse 35, I think, to 42. Mm-hmm. Aye, 42. So, 35, here we are. Again, the next day, after John was standing with two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, He saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which uh, being interpreted means Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt. (coughs) Excuse me. And abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah which is, of course, being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Something to do with the Greek and the Armenian translation. Glad you've been listening, Alistair. (laughs) We're going to sing again, this time the 23rd Psalm, The Lord's My Shepherd, Psalm 23. (laughs)
We come to our reflection on the scriptures now. I'd like to pray that, Lord, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I must say, uh, well, I don't actually have to say at all, but I'm going to say that I found preparing uh, for today more challenging than, than for a long time. And it's quite often the way when I come to the end of a series of reflections, I have to think where to go next. And I was pulled in two directions. Uh, and I've decided to bring the two places I was looking together. So looking back, we've survived uh, 2020, a year of a, a global pandemic. COVID-19 sounds a little old-fashioned, no, but it's still around. It's uh, from not last year, but the year before, remember? That's how it got the number 19. And uh, how has that experience affected our hopes and our prayers and our dreams of the future? As we think about this question, the two different places I went to was, were firstly John's Gospel, which Alistair has just read to us, but I also went way back uh, to the Old Testament, to Genesis. And so I want to share with you this question, Quo Vadis, where are you going? I think that's an appropriate thing to think at the start of the year. And, and I put Enoch as the character in the Old Testament that I wanted to look at. Now, you can maybe just trace that I've got the word Saint Enoch above the word Enoch there. For years... I took the Glasgow subway from Cessnock station to St. Enoch station and I never thought about Enoch or St. Enoch. In, this, in my uh, second year, I uh, started uni in 64, 65, 66. 66, St. Enoch station was demolished and left. there was a big hole in the ground for a long time. But the underground station was still there, still called St. Enoch, still in St. Enoch Square. Each day I walked across it through to, St. A to George Square and to the university where I was doing my engineering. And I never thought about St. Enoch. And possibly you've never thought about Enoch or St. Enoch either. But today I'm going to introduce you to St. Enoch. So let's, let's make a move. Let's, uh, let's take the words quo vadis, which is really just a Latin expression, comes straight out of the Vulgate translation of the Bible. Quo vadis, where are you going? That's what it means. Where are you... Where are you going? Uh, and I've picked the question, where are you staying? Which is the question that Alistair read to us. Where do you abide? Where are you staying? So I've got uh, five things to put in front of you. And I could have reduced it to three, but I decided to leave it at five because you're pretty good at hanging on to points. And, uh, and they're in the notes anyway. And the first thing is Jesus' question, what are you after? What seekest ye? What are you looking for? And the second question is the disciples' question. Because uh, Jesus doesn't, they don't really answer Jesus' question. Uh, they say, where are you staying? And those two questions are of interest to us. And then we go back to Enoch. And I want to introduce you very briefly to his life and times. Because it's a long time ago, Genesis chapter 5. A long time ago. But then, more importantly, I want to pick up with Enoch, whose walk breaks the cycle. And then finally, I want to talk about the blueprint and the nail prints. So, five points. Let's begin at the top. Jesus' question, what are you after? What are you looking for? What are we looking for in 2021? Jesus' question suggests that human beings are always focused on something. Because that's what he asks. What are you after? What, are you, what thing are you looking for? Well, I, I don't know if you've noticed, even though the shops have been kind of shut or on reduced output, there seems to be a, a proliferation of advertisements. Uh, the weekend papers, which we get, we don't get them during the week. Uh, at least Christine reads online, but uh, we don't get... Uh, a hard copy of the newspapers until Saturday and Sunday. And there are just so many advertisements in it. 
I'm just amazed how many, how many ads come through our letterbox. Keith came in this morning with the junk mail that was in our letterbox and I was glad he carried it to the recycle bin than me because I think he's probably stronger and more able to carry a load that size. So junk mail, advertising, there are lots of things from appliances, have you seen the appliance stores, from automobiles, new vehicle sales, from administration, who can manage it better? We're just mentioning three things that begin with the letter A, appliances, automobiles and administration. We're looking for improved delivery and better services. There are lots, of course, of legitimate things we want. We want full employment. We want good health. We want family unity. We want vaccine well distributed. We want political healing in the USA. We love peace on earth. Could it be true that as we look forward to the things we want, that we've already forgotten some of the things that we thought were very precious to us during lockdown? Less time spent on the roads, for example. More time with family. Simple things like board games or jigsaws. With grandchildren, perhaps cooking together. More time for the garden. Learning an instrument, perhaps. This is just the sound on the telephone of the voices of those we love. Let's not forget those things. Let's carry with us into the future lessons that, of what really matters in our lives and not be focused on the things. Because when Jesus says, what things are you after? The answer John records for us is Jesus uh, 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 being inquired about where he's staying. The disciples' question, that is, where are you staying? John described, had described Jesus to his disciples as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He'd said it twice now already in John chapter 1. He says it for a second time. This is the Lamb of God who's taking away the sin of the world. So they have the idea that he is the Messiah. What it means to them is no doubt very different from what it means to us because we have 2,000 years of musical history and artwork depicting Jesus as the Lamb of God. They didn't have that. The, could he be the Passover Lamb? In what sense could this person be the Passover Lamb? That wasn't a, something that they had really thought about. They knew that year by year at Passover... Uh, the Lord had rescued them and set them free. But what that meant with respect to the Messiah wasn't, hadn't been brought together yet. But they, were, they wanted to know. And as John's disciples, they'd been redirected from a teacher they respected to another teacher. The word in the authorised version which uh, Alistair read was master. In many translations it's rabbi. It's the word for a teacher. Unless we go to a really old-fashioned school, the teachers aren't called masters nowadays. But uh, in the old days, uh, a master was a teacher. But the rabboni is the, is the uh, Greek word here. Rabboni, teacher, where are you staying? So what we've got in the, in the disciples' question is that they want to know his place. Where is he? Because if you know where somebody stays, you can visit them. You can find them. They're intent, these disciples, on transferring their allegiance to Jesus and they want to come to his place. They want to discover where he is in Capernaum, of course, but they're going to discover more. They're going to discover his place in their lives and his place in Israel's history. There's so much more. And if you read on in John's Gospel, you'll discover that uh, he's, he's going to reveal to them that they too can come to his father's house where there is room for them all. What an amazing idea that John is going to open up. And it comes from this little question, teacher, rabbi, where are you staying? Where can we find you? In 2021, we might be interested in exploring his place in world history. As I think, for example, uh, Tom Holland has done in his book Dominion. He's, it's as if he's suddenly come to the understanding that, that Jesus has come to reign in world history, although he himself was a specialist in Greek and Roman history. And so we have uh, not just his place in world history to think about, but even more important, his place in our lives. What is his place in our lives? We're here this morning because we think 
his place in our lives is important. So why then would I switch to Enoch in the Old Testament? Well, there's a beautiful thing about Enoch, but I want to say several things before I draw out on that. I want to talk about Enoch's life and times because it's way back. Genesis chapter 5 takes us into the part of the, of, uh, the book of Genesis which is kind of prehistory. It's before the flood. It's way back. It's in a strange period of time that we don't fully understand. In Genesis 5, there's a list of Hebrew ancestors with their long ages. If you read that chapter, you'll find they live long, long ages. Methuselah, for example, the oldest person in the Bible, is in Genesis chapter 5. So what are we to think about that period of time? Well, I want to suggest to you that the numbers here were not written with a 21st century way of thinking. We might be puzzled by it. We might be challenged to think, uh, can these be right? What does this mean? Does it mean what I think it means? And the answer probably is no, it doesn't mean what you think it means. For a start, the symbols that we use for numbers uh, didn't exist in Bible times. They used the letters of the alphabet to tell us what numbers were. So that the first letter of the alphabet had the number one, and Aleph, it was Aleph, Baith had number two, Gimel, third letter, and so on, up to number, um, up to number uh, ten. And then they, they had other numbers. And then it, there were 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, so they gave them numbers which included uh, a, a selection of hundreds. And, and so you think, well, all right, how did they write a number? We can count up. But you see, every name has a number. Your name has a number. If, if you think about numbers this way, then your name, my name, G-R-A-H-A-M, the A's would be number ones. And so a number would rep, could be represented by my name. And you start to get into a, a weird and wonderful world of what do numbers mean. And not everybody thinks with a base of 10 like we do. For example, have you ever thought why we have 60 seconds in a minute? Why 60? And have you ever thought of why we have 60 minutes in an hour? It comes from Babylonian times. It comes from the ancient past. They're working with a base of 60. So it wasn't just Hebrew. It was the other languages that were related to it. They used letters instead of uh, letters of their alphabet for numbers. So it's important to ask, do the words mean in the language and culture? What do the words mean in the language and culture in which they were written? Well, the Sumerian king list. Let me just give you another little insight. From a similar period in time, we have lists on tablets of the kings of Sumeria. And they seem to operate on a scheme that we don't understand either. For example, the kings of, of Sumer had ages stretching to many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. One of them purportedly lived for 28 and a half thousand years. Now, if you think the names in Genesis 5 are long, Methuselah didn't even make it to 1,000. The Sumerian kings seem to go on and on. What, how did they get those numbers and what did they represent? Well, R.K. Harrison, uh, one of uh, the authors of books that I read when I was a theological student, says this. When the Hebrew and the Sumerian accounts are set side by side, it becomes apparent that the large numbers reflect a common, if poorly understood, Mesopotamian tradition and that the Genesis tabulation should accordingly be viewed against that cultural background. Now, my fear as I went back to Genesis was that we could get lost in thinking about this, and I don't want to do that. But in the... In the uh, in the uh, leaflet, uh, there, there's a, a reference to the, I think I put it in the leaflet, to biologos. Biologos, bio B-I-O-L-O-G-S. Perhaps I didn't put it in. But, yes it is. And if you go, when this leaflet is on the website, if you go to that, that uh, web page and click on it, you'll find an entrance into that discussion. For myself... 
I have the idea that the biblical writers are telling us that nobody lives as the, Hebrew, as the Sumerian kings did. They're telling us that something had happened to the human, humanity in its early stages that set us on a terrible path. And that terrible path involved other things that we come across in Genesis chapter 5. And that brings us to what else it tells us about Enoch, whose walk breaks the cycle. In the book of Genesis chapter 5, it serves three purposes. The first is that it reminds us that people matter to God. They're not mere statistics. They have names. Even then, they have names. Now, you and I, in these days when we're hearing about more than 1,000 people a day dying of COVID in the United Kingdom, 4,000 a day dying in America, uncounted thousands dying in other parts of the world, you tell that to God. You know what God says? God says, tell me their names. Tell me their names. See, they matter to God. They're people that he created in his image. We're happy to accept statistics. We can't possibly cope with that vast quantity of real humanity. But even from the patriarchs of ancient times, they're dignified with a name. They have names. They're precious to God. And the second thing that we discover in Genesis chapter 5 is that it leads us to Noah as a kind of deliverer of the people. That God is going to work to deliver people to safety. He's going to provide an ark of refuge for the human family. But the third thing that Genesis 5 reminds us is what Derek Kidner calls the dark reign of death. We're human beings and we are mortal. And that we don't escape death. And as you read through Genesis chapter 5... It tells us that so-and-so lived so many years and he had sons and daughters at such and such an age and then he died. And then the next person, the same thing. And then the next person. And so it goes on. And then it tells us, and let me read it to you. Then it tells us about Enoch. Verse 21. When Enoch was 65, he had a son, Methuselah, after that, Enoch lived in fellowship with God, that is, he walked with God for 300 years and had other children. He spent his life in fellowship with God. He lived to be 365 years old. He lived his life in fellowship with God and he disappeared because God took him away. Now, here's the thing. The person with the shortest lifespan, it disappears to be with God. What an extraordinary thing. But he walked with God. And that's why I got back into Genesis 5 in the first place. Here we are at the start of a new year. What kind of walk will we have in our lives this year? How, how will our footprints fall? I use the image of somebody walking on a road with the, uh, with the leaflet this week. Where will our foot, footfall take us as we journey through life this year? journeying through 2021, will we walk with God? While we're not told exactly what that meant in, in the book of Genesis, Moses, the likely compiler of the entire narrative, uh, who probably inherited the lists of the names from the, from the ancients, believed that uh, even before the flood it was possible for the ancestors to enjoy an intimacy with God. After the flood, we know that intimacy took other forms, we know that Abraham obeyed God and we know that Jacob wrestled with God. We know that the intimacy with God involved all of their lives. But has Enoch escaped the cycle of death? Well, notice that he disappears from the scene as a, a youngster, really, just 365 years old. Younger than anybody else listed. Could a departure to be with God be a blessing? How can we walk with God? That's the question that this chapter leaves us with. How can we walk with God? Well, I want to suggest under this heading, the blueprint and the nail prints, that we too can walk with God. From the book of Genesis, chapter 12, we're told that the plan of God was to bring blessing to Abraham's family and to all the nations, Jews and Gentiles alike, 
Last week we thought about the Magi coming to uh, the Bethlehem, to Bethlehem, searching for the, the King of the Jews. They were representative gen- Gentiles who had come to the light of Emmanuel. They remind us that the light of the world has universal reach. It spreads out into all the world. What was revealed in Bethlehem couldn't be kept in Bethlehem. Just as surely as that entailed a birth, it entailed a death too, as T.S. Eliot's poem tells us. In fact, T.S. Eliot, uh, in 1939, he wrote a book. And uh, it was a time when Germany was very focused on what it was wanting to do, 1939. And so in 1939, Eliot's book was published, and he was, he was asking the question about the idea of a Christian society. What would it look like? How could it embrace ordinary working men and women around the country? And he felt there was a, a lack of direction in the United Kingdom, especially compared to what was happening in Europe. And he recognised that the plan of God is not implemented by political ideology, God's blueprint has to deal with sin and evil in the human heart. It has to deal with greed and malice and ill will, desire for revenge, all of those things. But more more widely known than his book is his famous poem, Four Quartets. And in that poem, T.S. Eliot writes, and I read it uh, for the first time this week, Uh, just sat down and read the poem. Part of it says this, The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art, resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Now it just so happens, if anything just so happens, that this week we had an orthopaedic surgeon and some other friends visiting us. And I mentioned a young man that, I, that we had had for dinner who has motor neurone disease. So he's in his 50s and he has this affliction, which is a, a very serious affliction. And, and the surgeon friend said, oh, yes, he, he commiserated for our friend, the young man with the illness, And then he said he had a friend too who was a surgeon who developed motor neurone disease. And while ever he could, he continued to go to the operating and do the operating. And then when he couldn't do that, he continued to take an interest in his patients and manage their paperwork and their referrals and so on. Until he could not not do that any longer and basically he he stopped eventually his work. But what T.S. Eliot is showing us is that we need to be healed by somebody who couldn't save himself. The bleeding surgeon. uh, Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art. The shocking shocking image of a bleeding surgeon turns our eye to the yet more shocking image of a crucified saviour. Eliot has picked up this great theme of how God deals with sin and evil. And as we raise our eyes from the blueprint in the Bible to the Jesus who died for us, we have to see the nail prints in his hands. We have to know he died for us. It's not just a plan laid out in history and in our Bibles. but We have to come to Jesus who with his wounds invites us to come to him and has authorized this church to invite people to come. That section of the poem by Eliot continues in this way. The dripping blood, our only drink. The bloody flesh, our only food. In spite of which we like to think that we are sound, substantial flesh and blood. Again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. So he's uh, turning us to communion and to the fellowship we have with the Christ who wants to draw us close and to feed us. We want to come to where he stays. The disciples wanted to know where they could find Jesus. Where are you staying, they said. We too need to know where to find him throughout the year. Where will he be? Whatever we're looking for in 2021, let us find where the wounded surgeon is. 
and stay close to him. Let us walk with him into all that 2021 has in store. Amen. May God bless his word uh, to us from both Genesis and John this morning. Amen. I'm going to lead in prayer once again. Uh, we've come with our, with our own uh, hopes and prayers this morning. And I, I, before we say the Lord's Prayer, let me lead you in a word of prayer. Almighty God, you've loved us for a long, long time, and we know your love is real. We see it in the scriptures, in your naming and knowing the ancients. They were as fully known to you as we are. Like the ancients, we know you seek integrity of heart and righteous living, and like them we cannot save ourselves. We rely on your redemption blueprint. We thank you for that line of mercy reaching from beyond Enoch and culminating in the Lord Jesus. It's awesome to remember what our Lord did for us. We cause pain, but he came to heal. We break, but he came to restore. We have sinned, but he comes with forgiveness. We destroy, and we killed him. But he is making all things new. Lord Jesus, we come to you, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Help us by your Holy Spirit, whatever the future holds, to never lose sight of you and your great love for your wayward people. In a world of turmoil, we come to you, Lord Jesus, as the righteous King. Each day we have carried home to our consciences the terrible inhumanity of our species, our abuse of the environment, our damage to the animals with whom we share the planet, and in particular, our inhumanity to each other. Guide us in healing pathways. Guide our leaders, especially as vaccinations for COVID are rolled out. Please help us to ensure that they are triaged among the nations on the basis of need, not mere wealth. Keep in safety all who work on the front lines of caring for others, in hospitals, in aged care residences, in places of transit, in quarantine. Help all to stay mindful that there are people who are at risk. This week we've seen chaos in the capital of the USA. We pray that the incoming president and vice president will be given strength and grace to heal the divides that have been opened up in that country. Conscious that police, security and armed services of many nations do not always act with integrity and impartiality, we pray for those countries where this is commonplace, where we see evidence of excessive force, unlawful detention and brutality. We ask for restraint and a renewed hearing of the words of Jesus, who himself endured the hostility of sinners. We ask for mercy upon all who share the message of Jesus in harsh and difficult conditions. We think of your church prohibited in Saudi Arabia and undergoing persecution in North Korea, China, Iran, the Sahel region of Africa, and other places. If there must be martyrs, O Lord, may the blood of the martyrs prove to be the seed of the church. We pray for our own families, our loved ones, and for the difficulties that they are encountering at this present time. Whether it's health of mind or body, we lift our loved ones to you. We pray that you would bring restoration and good health by your spirit. And especially during this COVID-affected summer break, help families to find refreshment, that they may be patient and considerate of each other so that the summer break indeed provides reviving and encouraging in every home. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And finally, that hymn that Benny chose that I said just suited uh, so well. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Hymn 564, Guide Me. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love today and always.